So we're going to talk really quick about constructing personas. And we will go through some exercises next class, by the way, about constructing personas and about persona types, which I will talk to you about in a few minutes. So I'm going to go through these really quickly because when it comes to creating your personas, you actually are not going to be going through all of these steps, but I do want you to be aware of them. So how do we construct a persona? Well, first we identify behavioral variables, then we map interview subjects to behavioral variables, we identify significant behavioral patterns, we synthesize characteristics and relevant goals, we check for redundancy and completeness, we expand our description of attributes and behaviors, and then we designate our persona types. Now, who's memorized that? You don't have to memorize that, by the way. You do need to understand how to create personas. But I'm not going to ask you a question where I'm like, list in order these seven steps. But I want you to understand how to create personas in terms of what's involved in these steps. All right, so what's the first thing you should do? Well, the first thing you actually should do is do some research. You know, this may involve interviews if it's possible. It may involve some surveys if it's possible. It may be data that has already been collected about your potential subjects. So what you want to do is you want to go and see what type of information do you already have access to. Take a look at it. See what information you can pull out of there in terms of any behavioral variables that are typical of who you think your users are. Now, sometimes it may be that they're users of a similar domain, and you can start with that if you don't have anything better, because you are going to be testing this against actual users, hopefully. So you want to take that information. You want to list distinct aspects of observed behavior that you are able to get from this existing research. And you want to categorize it into a number of different types of things, activities. What does the user do? How often do they do it? How much time do they spend doing it? Attitudes. What does the user think about the product domain? What does the user think about technology? Whether you use technology in that domain or technology in general or both. What are their aptitudes? What do they know how to do? What's their education? What training does this user have in that particular domain? And what is their capability to learn in that particular domain? What are their motivations? Why are they using the product? Why are they motivated to use the product? That can also include what are their goals in using the product? So why is the user engaged in the product domain? And skills, what are the user capabilities related to that product domain and to technology? So once you go ahead and you're able to come up with some of these, you're going to go out and you're going to do some more interviews. Hopefully you will have access to that. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take that data and you're going to map your interviewees to these various dimensions. All right, so let's take a look at, at some variables really quick. There are actually two main types of variables, continuous and discrete. It's actually pretty easy to understand the difference. Continuous is basically where your range does not have distinct steps, where you have more of a smooth curve or a smooth line. So going from computer novices to computer experts, there are people, all sorts of people at all levels in between. Make sense? Then there's discrete. These are basically ones where you can actually see it as kind of like steps. So someone who uses a digital camera versus someone who's using a film camera versus someone who uses both. Those can be very, very discrete. You can even think of them as discrete categories. Those are the two different types of variables. So you want to take your variables, and for each one you want to build something like this, right? where you have each of your P's is a different person that you've interviewed. And this happens to be one variable that you have determined is important based, based upon your research. So now you need to figure out, okay, 
where do my people fall? Where, should my, where will my primary persona be? Who will be my secondary persona? Well, let's look at an example of an online bookstore. Right, so when we go looking for books, to purchase books online, we may have different motivations for who we're going to buy for. It may be you're looking for the best price, right? So, you know, you're a poor student, or you're like me, you're just cheap. You're going to look for the best price, and you know what? If it takes two weeks, no problem, because it's $5 less. Oh, but wait, the semester started, and you have a test next week. You need that book tomorrow. What's your focus now? Good service. You need it tomorrow. In that case, oh, who, who cares about the price? I need it tomorrow. I need good service because if not, I'm going to fail my test. So here is our service-oriented person. Here are our price-oriented people. So you map them out. Here's someone in the middle who just likes to balance both. So now that you've mapped it out, you go to our next step is where you want to identify significant behavior patterns. So I want you to look at this. And I want you to look to see, do you see any clusters? Price. Here's one cluster. See any other clusters, even if it's a cluster of one? Service. You know what that tells you? That's two different personas, potentially. Now I say potentially because you're going to be looking at numerous variables. But you look for your clusters. Look for clusters that are meaningful. By the way, you can find clusters that have nothing to do with each other. You know, so if you have a cluster where you find that there's a relationship, relationship between people who are vegetarians and they regularly buy, CD, buy CDs, is that a meaningful relationship? Probably not. Okay, yes, you can. Some of you are like, well, you know, if they're vegetarian, they're earthy, maybe they like old things. This was written before that. So you want to eliminate anything that doesn't seem to be meaningful. All right. You also want to then synthesize your characteristics and relevant goals. Now that you have your clusters, you want to look at your behavioral patterns and the ones that you've identified, and you want to go ahead and synthesize that, take some of the details from, of your, from some of your data, and create things such as, what is the potential use environment that this product is going to be used in? Because that's an important domain, an important variable. What is the typical work day or some other relevant context? What are the current solutions and frustrations? Because that will also come out when you are interviewing potential users. And also, this is something a lot of people don't think about, relevant relationships with others. Because these days, when we are interacting with technology, are we just interacting with ourselves many times? We're not. We're actually interacting with others. So how do we use the technology? How do others use the technology? Very, very important and becoming more and more important in industry these days. Then you want to go ahead. Now you have something that you know, might be closer to a persona. Not yet, because now you want to check for two things. One is redundancy, and the other is completeness. Because at this point, you may have two potential personas that are very similar. Except the difference may be one's male, one's female. In that case, do you think you really have two personas? Probably not. Basically, you want to make sure if you have two personas, you have to make sure that the distinctions are meaningful. If the only distinction is something like demographics, something like gender, or even something like age, but everything else is the same, you have redundancy. Get rid of one of them. It doesn't really matter which one, just get rid of one of them. You only need one persona in that case. And are there any gaps? Based on your research, are there any potential users that seem to be missing? You're more likely to have redundancy than gaps, usually, 
if you have access to information. Usually you'll have gaps when you do not have access to information. So at this point now you have a nice outline of a persona. What you want to do is you then want to expand your description of attributes and behaviors to really develop and build your persona. You're going to include things like a third person narrative about their attitudes, what their needs are, what are their problems. Right? You're also going to create some fictional situations. Those are actually scenarios, which we'll talk about next time. And again, a picture. Because remember, you want to bring in information and elements that are going to help us connect with our personas to help connect with our users.